It is a pleasure to be back. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for those of you who are here uh, to hear my new work, Four Headed Woman. And people say to me, well, what's this title about? So I'll start with the title. And since we have one young man in our midst, um, but the rest of you are women I know who are very much aware that as professional women, we need at least four heads to get along in the day. Um, many times we are operating with many more than four heads, but for me, four heads were appropriate in terms of my woman is head, the woman who takes care of me, myself, you know, the relationship head, um, whether that is marriage or uh, whatever kind of relationship one has, the head about the work, which is very different and which is very important. And the older I get, the more important the work has gotten, partly because this fourth head that has to do with children, I am gladly and happily relieved from that because my youngest child graduated from college last May. So that head, and, and, and as, as you know, there are mothers here who are also grandmothers or coming to be grandmothers. One person had said to me that you never end being a mother. And I thought, oh no, my kids are going to be gone. But I'm telling you, they're scattered all over, but they call me. So I'm still mothering. It's not the day to day, but they call you for all kinds of things. And you have to listen. And if you're not available, you're never there when I need you <laughs> kind of stuff. So that head is still there, but very um, operating very different. The book is also divided into four sections, and in many ways it's a womanist book, but it's also, I think like much of my work, it's a book that is open and available to everyone. Um, but a lot of the things in here will resonate with women, and I will read poems from each of the sections. So the first section is called What's Inside. And in that section, I was really looking at, um, you know, I start off with the various breads. Every culture has a bread, you know, um, which serves as the sustenance for that culture. Um, you know, whether it's roti or bake, you know, Jamaica have their Johnny cake. Uh, Ethiopia has its injera. The Native Americans in America have their fry bread. So that section starts with that. The whole, there was an essay, and I can't remember who it was by, but you know, it was basically talking about how women write about the domestic space. And the domestic space is not political. Of course, it was a man who was saying that, uh, because there's nothing more political than the domestic space. So for women, it's the way in which we use that domestic space to not only work out social and political issues, but also it becomes the center of the politics in what we do. What's inside? She chews and spits out parts of herself she cannot integrate. Fry bread. After they branded her betrayer, she became a vagabond, slinking behind trees, jumping over skeletons. Every time she spat, a story got lost but for coyote licking at her phlegm. And it's a very interesting phenomenon that has happened with particularly native women, how they're often branded as traitors, and therefore their contribution in so many ways get lost. And of course, for those of you who are familiar with Native American culture in North America, coyote is very much like our Anansi, our trickster figure. And so for me, it is really important to always start there because a lot of times we tend to forget about the first because of how we, we came here. And so it's always important for me to pay tribute to that, but also to pay tribute to the way in which women have been, in a sense, marginalized. And I hate that word. It's not a word that I like to use as an academic word. Um, but the way in which women um, who have survived and who have found other ways to survive, the way in which they're oftentimes dismissed. And so um, my work is always about bringing those women back into the center. In Jira, um, I have a lot of Ethiopian friends. Jamaica's had a long connection with Ethiopia, partly because of the Rastafarians, and I have to 
give them credit for bringing a conscious black awareness to Jamaica because they really were the first ones who did that. Um, and I, I have a number of uh, Ethiopian friends and I love Ethiopian food. The other option was to have eyes in the back of her head. She was not into dictating, having learned the value in flexibility from living more than four scores. She understood some just had to be led, even ordered for the good of the whole. Faith was more than prayer. She was her own miracle. And that's something that I think is really important as we really move into this new century is that we begin to empower the world and we begin to empower ourselves and we begin to understand that we are our own miracle and each day the various positive actions that we do um, is no less and not to um, necessarily cause conflict here it's no less than the miracles that we attribute to others, be it God or Mohammed. And more of us need to step into those roles because I think if we were to read, if we read those various scriptures very carefully, then we see that in fact that is what we were expected and are expected to do each day um, and not to relinquish our power and to wait kind of thing. <clears throat> Roti, which I also love, and since we are here, um, Lizards crawled in front of her path, paused, raised their necks tall, peered at her. She had a knack for figuring out the finite in the infinite. She, the third child, breached at birth. In her presence, elders hopped memory of their yesterday years, often folded in a draw, firm with the knack to unfold and transform. What she lacked in affection, she made up for with a generous helping of common sense, indisputable, the trump card. And let me just talk a little bit here about, uh, well, let me read these next two poems and then I'll talk a little bit about the trajectory of my work and how I think these, where I think my poems are now from people who are familiar with my, my other, my, my earlier poems. Coconut Bread, which is also something I love, which is all throughout the Caribbean. Hungry chickens in a coop, water spilling from busted pipe, the bass of the music playing a haunting rhythm in her stomach, if this was how it had to be, she would recline, massage her lower abdomen, knead oil into her limbs, then go among them, a breeze they welcome in the heat of the day. Cornbread. Exit backwards, her father warned, armor against the covetous wagon, tongues of married women. She would not lay beneath any man or allow his insecurity to determine the path her feet would take. A smile can beguile the most ruthless adversaries. She knows the caterpillar's secret. In these poems, which I think is a departure from my earlier poems, and I'm working on a new collection, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end. Um, I f for me, these poems are philosophical, and I have arrived at a place that I've been wanting to arrive at for a long time. I consider myself a storyteller and poetry is one of the vehicles through which I tell stories. My earlier poems, I am less sure, less sure so that I give more. In these poems, I'm more sure so I'm giving less because I don't think people need all of the details that I used to give in my previous works. And more so than the details, I want them to fill in the blanks. Um, so, and, I, and, I, and there's a kind of philosophical bent now at this stage in my life, um, in my fifth decade, right, that I'm, I'm working towards. So the poems, it's my own musing and my, me working out my own philosophical bent, but also feeling that I don't need to give people all the things that I need to give them, that there is enough here you know, um, for them to, to pick through and get what needs to happen. 
so the, the book continues with, you know, tortilla and pita bread and stuff, and then I get into some of the herbs um, <clears throat> that are, again, essential to us as a people, as a culture, diasporically, I'm speaking, and the things that we use and what they mean. So they're food, okra is food, but it is more than that. So what I'm searching for in these poems, even in these various breads that I'm using, is not just what it is, but what it represents culturally, what it represents socially, what it represents historically, the way in which women um, prepare these foods. I also love okra, you know. Nothing gave her greater joy than to knead clay, mold it into something she could never have imagined. In Zynga warriors, something that feeds people's heart stirred their generosity. The blue cotton against skin fortified their aim. Amputated breasts, female archers. So, you know, what does okra have to do with Nzinga and women amputating their breasts and being archers? And how does it connect with us today in the Caribbean? I leave that for readers to put together. I am simply presenting it. I am giving various um, threads, and I say, you now weave whatever it is you want to weave. Um, and then we have all of these fruits, um, and I've gone to some of the more scientific names in terms of looking at them. Um, Gamboji. As she sits now on the small, low bench in her backyard under the shade of the guinep tree, washing her hands paws. As far back as she can remember, she has sat like this, even as an infant, near the gate of the school beside her mother, who sold sweeties and fruits to the children at lunchtime. Then, as a woman, she sat like that, at the stall her husband built for her to sell ground provision. If only she could stand up and walk away, walk far off, without looking back. You know, and I think of both all of these women who were less fortunate than me, because I had an opportunity to walk off and look back and not look back. But for those women who don't have that opportunity for a variety of reasons, you know, and then they come to what they feel is the end of their life and they wonder what would have happened if they had been able to walk off and not look back. And again, culturally, historically, because we're the purveyors of cultures and because we have been both praised and maligned for keeping the family together, um, we have not been able to do some of the things that we were here to do. We've done other things, but I think many women can look back and say, I didn't get to do what I was supposed to do. Um, so I'm not going to read any more from this section. I'm going to go to the section that gave me the most pleasure. <laughs> it's called That Certain Time of the Month. <laughs> uh, she always popped the balloon, the crystal knitted on her tongue. And you know, I started my menses very young and I was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> to say goodbye. <laughs> but then, of course, you're visited by something else <laughs> that you have to deal with. But menses, your period, informs so much of your life. You know, um, I had mine very young at 10, and I was a tomboy always taking off my shirt, running around, playing on my mother. And all of a sudden, she's telling me, I am a lady now. What that mean to me, a little 10-year-old girl who want to run off in the canal and swim with the boys? Because the boys were always having more fun. The girls had to stay home in my generation and play with Dolly. I never wanted to play with no Dolly. <laughs> 
You know, I never wanted to sit in no dress with my legs crossed at the ankles. That was never me. Um, so, I don't know how much work has been done or will be done. I am hoping many, much more work will be done about the impact of menses, not just on women, because we know it also impacts the family. You know, I had two daughters and a son, and my son learned very young because I was divorced what that meant. <laughs> And he says, okay, mommy, I'll bring you some tea, <laughs> you know, leave me alone, <laughs> kind of stuff. And then when his sister started, he was surrounded by women. And those of you who are women, you know that the cycle, it happens, everybody. Synchronizes. <laughs> you know, it's all the women. <laughs> and um, so initially, for a very many long, for many years, I was at odds with my body. I was, you know, this was a terrible thing. Um, I remember as a girl in school, invariably, you know, girls would have to walk behind other girls because you with the pads and stuff, you know, your uniform and you don't expect it. It's just, anyway. She is here again every month, although I'm never sure when she will appear. I feel myself losing it. I can't prevent my crash into the cotton tree. My fantasies are borderline to be fondled roughly, urgently by many hands, the owners of which I do not know, gender irrelevant, to dig a hole and climb in. I blame this red cousin for my libidinous cravings, antisocial undoing. Oh, to own my body. Speak the language it understands. Submit to shameful desire. Something in the mouth, a candy, a cock. Drifting, too tired to stay alert. Drifting, too tired, must get work done. She smells this red cousin, ponderous as the earth, complete as yam. Red cousin arrives, ooze, oozing. I have a date, I plea. I am not up for your company. Red cousin chuckles, lets herself in. We are attached, the camaraderie of sisterhood. And then I don't know how I stumbled on PMS Advice Nurse, but I love PMS Advice Nurse for the, irre you know, the irreverence. And I think um, in poetry, in art, there has to be a level of irreverence for it to, to really... Um, leap off the page or off the paint or off the drum or whatever and the PMS advice nurse provides that irreverence. Indulge red cousin, hers is but a short stay, four days tops, in rare cases seven days of hell. Cosset her by pampering yourself, resist not temptation of any kind, especially sweets, chocolate with Brazilian nut, a must. Menzi's recipe, four days, a com four days, four down days, one comfortable bed, TV with cable and remote, 10 glasses, alone time, three tablespoon letting it all go, one ounce push on through. Combine alone time, letting it all go, push on through in a bowl, mix gently with a plastic spatula, set it on the bedside table, turn on TV, demand pampering and uh, that is really something that only much later on in life I realized was essential and I played it to the hilt <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I recommend you know and I was doing research on menses and all of these cultures African and Native American cultures that had menses hut and how valuable they were and how essential they were um, for for women so I'm going to read that last, but let me just read a few more. Um, there's this one I tell my children how lucky they are. Um, I don't know if I can find it, but. So it was also interesting to, to find out all of the stuff that I did in my research about, you know, menses, um, PMS and PMDD symptoms. 
And for those of you who don't have the book, um, I do have copies for sale, but one of the things that becomes important is the form of the poem. So it's not just the language that you use, but it's also the form. And as I started to write these poems, they just did not want to be traditionally on the right-hand side. They said, we were something else. And they were, um, so the left-hand margin. And, and then there are times when um, you're, not, you're not quite sure what goes where. I am anxiety, anger, outburst, fine. I am fine. I am fine. Cramps, cravings for salt and sweet. I am fine. I am fine. Really fine. Depression, decreased balance, dizziness, fine, fucked up, irrational, neurotic, emotional, endema, fatigue, just fine, thank you, headaches, my period again, the second time this month, tearfulness, most women have a 28-day cycle, I have a 21-day cycle, how special, it's amazing I have enough blood to do anything. In 1950, doctors Gregory Pincus and John Rock, commissioned by the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, goal, develop simple and reliable form of contraception. Wasterender Foundation for Experimental Biology, their lab. 6,000 women in Puerto Rico and Haiti, their guinea pigs. Their invention, NVIDIA 10, marketed in the US 1960. What is not footnoted here, is um, the impact of this experiment on um, Puerto Rican women and Haitian women. Um, and that after a seven year, I think after a 10 year period, they found that there were girls and, and, and women in Puerto Rico, some of whom started their menses as early as five or seven, which was blamed on this um, experimentation. Menses recipe four, one bundle of callaloo or spinach or greens, clove of garlic, yellow or sweet onion, thyme. Wash greens thoroughly. Saute garlic, thyme, and onion in olive oil. Add greens, cook until tender. Do not overcook or as a flaccid penis. Even if you are a vegetarian, have lamb chops today. Really, you need to tear into flesh. Drink a glass of Merlot with lunch and again at dinner. Um, so I had fun with this. I really enjoyed <laughs> uh, working on these poems and reworking them. Menstrual Hut. And I really recommend that we uh, go back and retrieve. Women go to the Hale, Pali, the Hale Piha in Hawaii, nourish their power, restore balance. Jaman no want a woman cook food during that time. Stories whispered. Now eat stew peas from any woman. You can never tell. It will bind, cast a spell, tie you to her forever. Simbo people of Papua New Guinea, among Indonesians, West Africans, almost everywhere. Sister to sister, relief from work, break from men, removed from the community. They, tell, they told stories, guarded their solitude, grew powerful, influenced the men using their blood. Real, sometimes staged, to clear a space for feminine positioning. Most times, I'm an even-tempered, congenial person. Some even say I'm gregarious, but not today. No private room or isolated contentment. Give me shared space where woman to woman gather, laugh at man's folly, and squash his fear. A menstrual hut where woman can just be in charge of nature's energy. And I think everybody here knows its connection to the moon, and that's a very powerful time for women um, that has somehow in many cultures have become malign. There's a lot of rituals around menses and the, what women do with their menstrual blood and the various implications of binding or tying or overpowering that it has in most cultures. So in as much as girls, I think, are not, I don't know about you guys, um, but I think I can speak for some of us on this side because of our age. 
but um, for those of you who are younger I don't know what training you had pretty much my mother didn't talk we didn't at my generation we were not told much <laughs> you know at least I wasn't told much I was given a little booklet and I was told I was a woman now and I was to keep myself clean and not to let boys touch me that was the extent of my education and keep my keep my legs closed and my dress down <laughs> okay um, and so it's unfortunate because in other cultures, and we might, I don't want to digress here, but I do want to say something about those cultures that have rites of passage for women, where, you know, I'm, and I'm not talking and in any way sanctioning um, genital mutilation, but what those cultures have is a way in which girls are trained not only about their bodies, but trained to be women and to accept or to have a role in society. We are not doing that. And we are really, um, then allowing our girls to be leg obese. And we need to begin to reinstitute a program where girls are trained about their bodies and what to expect and all of the ramification but to enter womanhood in a congenial and harmonious ways. You know, when my daughters came of age, we had, um, I had parties for them where all of their aunts, you know, and my sisters and my mother, you know, we sat down and we, we each gave them our story of what it was to be woman so that they had a much fuller sense and they also knew that there were other women they couldn't come to me about certain things because sometimes your children don't want to come to you but there are aunties in the community they could go to and talk to about certain things so we really need to do that because without that our men are also uh, left with you know not being able not knowing how to approach and deal with our women the next section I think is the most important section because it's a section we are afraid of, it's a section we don't talk about, it's a section of madness. It's a section of how pressure drop and some women are unable to keep it together and they go mad, stark, raving mad. And that many of us are walking around crazy mm -hmm. because we don't have the time or the luxury to have a breakdown and we need one. Yeah. There were many times in my life, especially as a divorcee with three children, where I literally needed to have a breakdown. And I didn't have that space. So for me, this book is about creating space for women and saying these are the gaps that are missing in our society. And we need to look, relook at our society and our culture and provide spaces so women can have this time so they don't walk around mad. You know, sometimes you say, what's wrong with her? There's just too many things she has to deal with. And so she snaps at you, she bitches at you, she talks about you, because she really need a week when somebody's taking care of her children and taking care of her house, and she can just be in her own space taking care of herself. Four-headed woman. So this is me, this is autobiographical. Somewhere in the midst of everything buried between the garbage of roles, hidden among the rubbles of demand is a headless life, probably my own. Has anyone seen or turned it in to the lost and found department? Perhaps it was snatched and gagged by kidnappers holding out for ransom. Maybe a pickpocketer grabbed it assuming value can do the mother in bit but cannot do the wife in poems must be written who decides what's easier what falls by the way in my imaginings me was always at the center activities swirled around me not tornadic me helter skelter clutching at air this is my life after all you know and some of you might be able to find your life in there one of the things I realized I had to do <clears throat> about two years ago and it was the best thing because it taught me so much about myself and it taught me so much about what I had that I realized that I didn't need I decided that I wanted to do more work I wanted to write I didn't want to die with some of the stories and poems inside of me so I decided that in the spring I wasn't going to teach. I was just going to hang out. I was going to sit on my front steps, which I sometimes do in St. Croix, and look at the hill and have my coffee or my tea and an hour pass and I don't even know what that hour is. It's a luxury I've never had for 
30 years. And it, it's not a luxury, you know, but it is so essential now for my well-being, for my balance. And people say to me, you look younger. And I think it's because I'm not stressed. I'm not teaching all the time and trying to write and raise kids. I have the space for myself. And what it has taught me is that I don't need all the material things that I thought I needed anyway. <laughs> you know, and that what I'm living off, I'm amazed that I'm living off it. But of course, it's a different lifestyle because the work is important to me and I want leisure time to just think, to un unburden my mind and to write. Um, so let me read a few more of these. Breaking point five. I cannot find words that sound the laugh I belch up. This laughter lacks a larynx. If you heard it, you would know all the animals have jumped ship. The night weeps from such loneliness. I feel the hysteria turning inside on itself. I am not rhetorical. The cow might jump over the moon, but it was morning. You know, and again, we have heard that crazy kind of laughter in other people, you know, and we, we, we hear the breaking point, but again, we dismiss it because we have to go on. This piece, Breaking Point um, 8, is actually based on a student of mine. She was one of my students, and in graduate school, this happened to her at Berkeley. He took my tongue, that professor, the paramedic pushed his hand in my pants. My children are plucked from my arms. Who says who is crazy? He came down from the platform from behind the podium, and he asked me, the only black in the lecture hall of over 200 students, what's so special about black children? Why did my tongue betray me? Words ran from my mouth, crippled adults escaping the blazing building. Terror was a new feeling. I could not undress. Their eyes echoed his scorn. Whoever made me a black woman in America refusing the hand-me-down dress I was ordered to wear? He clipped my tongue. The paramedics strapped me in. The nurse admitted me. And she had a nervous breakdown and called me, and I did visit her. Um, so sometimes we are unable to escape. Unnerving one. The wind flirts with the flowers, but sometimes, just to make a point, it snaps one. She had smelled herself long enough to like her taste. When she had had enough, her fist smashed through the mirror and she licked the shards. Seeing is often akin to blindness. Her blood dripped into her open, beaked mouth. <clears throat> Break point. Pray that you never live to witness the tearing away of tissue the grunt that has no beginning but gets louder. Pray that she never reaches the end of any rope, that blood doesn't cloud her eyes. Run when the sound of the machete hitting against a stone sends sparks flashing. Pray she never forgets herself completely, that she keeps love around even in a bottom drawer. Hide when the fist balls, knocking at thighs. It's not the sound of talking drums. Pray, despite scorn and rejection, despite faked food or starvation. Pray, pray hard and long. Pray as if your life depends on it. It does. Pray solemnly and diligently that you never have to witness her break in point. Pray. Keep praying, pray. So that's that section. And for me, it's a really important section. As a poet, as a cultural activist, because that's how I see myself, and we have one of the great cultural activists um, in, of Trinidad, I'm too, in the audience. Um, and I'm sure she can identify with a lot of these poems. For me, the work is to help me but it's also to help others before they get to that point. 
you see and you know my my dance with poetry has always been a dance of clarity I've always been a dance of teaching um, and while I understand the academic scriptures and I practice some of those tenets, to me the poetry is to heal if it ain't doing that then it's not serving any purpose certainly no purpose that I'm about this last series bathroom graffiti series um, I started many years ago when I was teaching at Berkeley UC Berkeley and in the women's bathroom and most college campuses I haven't visited here but in the USA the bathrooms are really the political sites because on any walls or cubicles are messages and cryings that women write and so I remember the first time I started to teach at Berkeley going into one of the women's their faculty restrooms but I went into one of just a regular women's restroom because I was running as running late and I was just amazed by all of the things on the walls and I sat there and I got to class late reading them you know and every time I went there were more and there would be lines connecting because the dialogue that is happening these anonymous dialogue but this hunger to say this is what I'm feeling and I need help can you help me so this is how that series were born and I actually some of these are found poems not none of them are totally found poems but I literally lifted lines from the bathroom um, because you know I just I myself couldn't come up with it um, and then I thought well I wanted to create this tapestry I wanted people to understand what was happening there but I also wanted to understand my own induction into graffiti and um, so I had to trace back and so this poem was is the last poem that was written after all of these other poems because then I thought well if you're writing about bathroom graffiti you have to figure your you have to you have to go back to your own genesis when did that start for you um, so this one is called introduction to graffiti and I remember this very clearly it's it's like I can still see my little self going into the bathroom at uh, Blake's preparatory school in Jamaica you know and and loving that I found this poem and of course you know nowadays we say all of these words very frequently but in my days you didn't say that you didn't say the SHIT word that was a curse word I mean and I still wouldn't say that word today my mother is 85 I would never say that in front of my mother today you know because that's how we were raised you didn't and especially if you were being trained although I resisted it to be a lady you didn't curse you did not curse introduction to graffiti on the first day of third grade after lunch when I went into the toilet the third stall like always I noticed on the back of the clean door written in pencil so small it appeared as a mark I had to squint to read it pussy I peed then reread the word again pussy was someone speaking about my private part concealed between my legs that place my mother always made sure I kept hidden put your legs down close your legs don't climb that tree without a shorts pull down your dress my chocho my little girl thing was someone looking under my dress like those rude boys crouching by the stairs I ran my finger over the words until it was erased a black smudge remained and so you know I remember that and then that was really the only curse word there was when I was growing up you know and the way it was written so the next piece is talk enticed by graffiti because um, and I'm always tempted I have to admit that I'm always tempted still to respond because um, now many of the colleges in the US they have chalkboard like at my college at California College of the Arts we have chalkboard because they got tired of 
cleaning them and so now they have chalkboards with, and they put crayon they put uh, chalk in there so that women can write and then they can be erased and I have not responded but I'm always tempted to respond but I did respond in this one in Ties by Graffiti each day I inspected the cubicles to see which one had been baptized. Written on the wall behind the toilet on the farthest cubicle in block letters in blue ink, P-U-S-S-Y, -S like an abstract painting encircled in a heart shape. A month later, the entire back door was covered with pussy, pussy in pen, pussy in crayon, my pussy written in cursive, he sucked my pussy sloppily scribbled, was, the gla was she glancing around as she wrote P-U-S-S-Y, P-U-S-S-Y in large letters, he feels up my pussy, puss me ugly pussy in small neat script, not pussy someone X'd out, but pum pum, my pum pum written in even elegant hand and diagonally across the wall in red ink PU uppercase S S Y is dangerous is sweet your mama's pussy pussy and I remember seeing that and was just like it was the most scandalous thing it was the absolutely most scandalous thing so those that these three poems, the first three poems in here were actually written last because I was done with the book and I thought well you have to trace your own genesis into this um, thing. <clears throat> um, so let's see, I don't know how are we doing for time? We're good? So I have to just tell you this that at the back of the book is a, a uh, a play, a one-act play, Bathroom Graffiti Queen, that was produced in, in Oakland um, a couple of times. I didn't direct it. Um, I actually did an excerpt of it first as a, um, at a solo performance, a 15-minute piece. And then last year when I was in St. Croix in the spring, as I am these days, I directed it with a, an amazing actress by the name of Oceana James. And so um, my goal is that the whole, this last section will be performed. You know, it's, it's, and it's not, someone said to me, and I hadn't thought about it, that it might be the next stage of the vagina monologue. You know, it's another kind of thing. But anyway, this last piece at the back, Bathroom Graffiti Queen, a poetic performance piece, um, brings much of the book together because the leading character, queen of uh, bathroom graffiti, is a woman who is at a breaking point and who has in fact, um, has a nervous breakdown and is one of these people you see on the streets, you know, maybe one of these homeless women you see on the streets. And so, um, let me, I wasn't, I don't know why I'm thinking, I think this is a good venue to read some of it. Um, I, I hadn't thought that I was going to read it, but I think I will. Um, and let me see if I can find a section where she declares this is who she is. Um, I hadn't planned to read it, so I can't find it, so maybe I'm wasting time. Uh, and I'll read something else and I'll look for it another time. But anyway, in this piece, she declares to no one and to everyone because the, the play is set inside a restroom and there are these three other people who come in, women who come in and write things on the wall and queen of the bathroom graffiti who is dressed eclectically and speaks Caribbean, speaks you know, like she's from England, speaks African-American kind of stuff. She speaks in these various dialects. She declares, don't you see me? I am queen of the, buff the bathroom, you know? I have the burden of answering these women's questions. And of course, different women come in. So anyway, let me go back to the poems that I had planned to read and read them, Bathroom Graffiti 10. Your daughter comes home between spring break. You notice she has gained weight and she seems obsessed with food. You invite her to go jogging with you, but she stares at you hard and shaking her head sadly begins to admonish you. You should love your body. You eat healthy for life and eat healthy for life. Don't try to be a 90 pound stick or go on a crash diet. 
Look at her as if she has lost her mind. She leaves you feeling stupid and locks herself in the bathroom. Confused, you pace around. Five minutes pass, your daughter is still in the bathroom. Ten minutes, twenty minutes, concern you knock on the door. Silence, then a flush, your daughter emerges with a grin on her face and you go to relieve yourself. Then you see the scribble on the wall. Fat disempowers women. Bullshit, only if you think it does. Ara connects both responses. You fight back tears. Your poor daughter stressed from the pressure of school. You go to wash your hands and between the sink and the medicine chest sprawled in red, diets, disempower women, love your body. You wash the tears from your eyes, take a deep breath and plan what to say to your daughter but words leave you. The bathroom door reads. Lack of self-esteem disempowers women. It makes us vulnerable to all kinds of psychological manipulations. You nod your head in agreement and enter the kitchen feeling very thin. Um, and then two more and then I'll entertain questions. Um, bathroom graffiti four. In every cubicle, an Every inch of wall at my daughter's campus in all manners of writing style, questions and answers abound. One, how often do you masturbate and how long does it take you to get, reach an orgasm? And actually this question I saw in several bathrooms so I thought I had to include it. Um, two, I reach an orgasm through masturbation but never while having sex. Three, and, and again as I was saying before that you know in these women's restroom there are these questions, whether it's about abortion or masturbation or whatever, and they're political questions. And there are these responses, you know. What does it feel like? Is it incredible? Will I ever reach it? Please help. Four, have you discussed this with your lover? If you do so, if, if not, do so. Have your lover, him or her, please you the same way you do during masturbation. Five, try foreplay. And by the time you get around to intercourse, there should be there shouldn't be too much problem. Six, not all women climax during intercourse. See a sex therapist. Seven, if all of the above fails, try God. He gives good head. So part of the irreverence there. Um, <clears throat> and then I will end with, um, I will actually end with an excerpt from, um, I will actually end with an excerpt from the um, poetic drama at the end. Um, and, and let me just fill you in a little bit. So bathroom queen, queen of the bathroom graffiti, she's a woman who has gone through a nervous breakdown. And throughout the course of the play, you don't really know what happened to her, but you get a sense that at one time she had a you know, family, she had a daughter, because she keeps uh, calling on her daughter. Um, but even though she has a nervous breakdown, like typical women who are stressed and, 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 and pressed for stuff, she still feels she has to be of service. You know, we're very service-oriented people. What can I say, to, so this is her speaking on page 131. What can I say to this poor girl to put her mind at ease? I know what she means. Some man stopped me for five straight years. He was as crazy as a fly near fire, but no one would help me. The only way I got rid of him was to, more, to be more crazy than he was. I got to be that sometimes I had to leave a note to remind myself, a note to myself to remind myself that I should stop being crazy when I got home. That's how, th that's how crazy things can get, trying to stay alive and safe. And I think that's an appropriate note to end. <clears throat>